Okay, I, I trust that the people online can see. Miti, can they see? Okay, good. All right, so uh, just to, to revisit again, I hope that uh, you will develop a consistent reading habit, a way of looking at scripture. OIA stands for observation, interpretation, and then application. And then as we study the scriptures, we must be reminded again that the Bible is written for us to know God. Right, first and foremost, it's not for us to so that we can be successful in life, so that we can run away from sin and all that. No, no, no. Although that is, these are important things. But the first and foremost focus is for us to know God. Right? Uh, Why we read the scripture is for us to know God. So that's why I hope that we have a theocentric, means God-centered way of looking at the scripture. And I hope that in, in so doing, we also begin to develop a prayer habit. Now, what I hope to see from all of you is that do read the Bible before you come. Do engage in the class so that we can have we can learn together. Uh, active reading. Let me take effort to highlight your scriptures. Your your so that there is activity involved. All right. Uh, so mark, reflect, and journal. I'll be showing you more about how to reflect, especially for Psalms. As part of the question earlier, we share that um, Hebrew Bible, uh, Hebrew poetry emphasizes a lot on ideas. Unlike the English poetry that focus on rhyme and rhythm. And ideas are communicated differently. Generally, they tend to be pictorial in nature. And what we'll be covering, we rec uh, last week we already covered Psalms 1 and 2. Today we'll go on Psalms 22, 23, and 24. Right? Of course, Psalms 23 being the most popular Psalms. Uh, next week, then we'll talk about the, sad, uh, the deep, most depressive Psalm next week. And I think just now they, they did a wonderful job to recap for us again about the three different types of Psalms. All right? One is synonymous, that means same meaning. Uh, that means the first line is, is the same as the second line, but they are just expressed differently. Then we talk about antithetical, uh, antithetic parallelism, that means a contrast, opposite ideas. Then synthetic means that the first, the second line builds on the first line. Okay. We talk about the different type of reflection because poetry is pictorial. And so there's a need for us to, to spend a bit more time on reflecting on it. So we talk about mirror, which is uh, where am I now? As, as, as you compare yourself with the scripture. Bino talks about really what is the big picture that God is showing me. Micro, what is the specific area? Yes, sir. Uh, this one. Uh, is it me to unmute or someone else to unmute? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Then we talk about uh, micro will be specific area. Cognitive will be what is something content? Uh? Cognitive is really a content, something new that I learned. Psychomotor is really how to apply. And then effective is uh, what are the values that I need to change. Yeah, so that is, uh, these are the six different ways that will help us. Right? Now last week we end off with Psalms 2. So I share with you about Psalms 2, the voice of the apostate nations, the voice of the almighty God the voice of the anointed, and then lastly, the voice of the altar. Now, I may not have highlighted this to you, but Psalms 2 is part of this group of Psalms known as the Messianic Psalms. Now, today, I want to introduce you to this concept called the Messianic Psalms. What are Messianic Psalms? So, Mes um, Messianic Psalms can, be can have two different ways of looking at them. One is, in a narrow sense, it means that it is prophetic and it has no direct message of significance to the Old Testament period. They only predict the coming Messiah. This is a very narrow definition of Messianic Psalms. But most of the Psalms I submit to you belong to the general sense that the Psalms anticipate the Messiah but also have meaning in its contemporary context. So like when, when it, uh, Psalms 2, when the Psalmist wrote about it, there are certain 
relevant to him at that point that he was writing. Similarly, when we coming to Psalms 22 afterward, Psalms 22 written by uh, David, all right? Uh, it was for David. David was going through certain problems. But at the same time, he has that, he has the, it will be further fulfilled by Jesus Christ, all right? So that is the general uh, sense of the Messianic Psalms. Some Psalms are prophetic of the Messiah Jesus. Right, given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they sometimes speak about the concept and the person beyond the author's understanding and knowledge. That means when the author writes it, right, the author has no idea he's actually describing the coming Messiah. Right, as far as the author is writing it, he, he was writing it about his own journey. But there's a future fulfillment. So these are the 16... Uh, Messianic Psalms. Don't worry about these slides. I'll make them available online after this. All right. So some of you have been asking me about notes and all that. Don't worry. Uh, all this will be made available uh, after today. All right. On our BBTC website. So you can hear uh, uh, the recording for this Zoom meeting. I trust that you are being, rec being recorded. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the notes will be, the, the PowerPoint slides will be made available as well. Okay. So more of tuning in. Uh, see what the Lord is teaching you during this time. Okay, so these are the 16 uh, commonly known Messianic Psalms. Some people like to put it this way, all right? The talks about the first coming, the second coming of the Messiah. Now, today we're going to cover Psalms 22, all right? Psalms 22, they're all together 31 verses, all right? Um, and I thought it's good for us to read the Psalms together. For those of you who are on site, uh, how about reading together with me? All right, because those of you online, I can't hear you. All right, but all those all of you on site, why don't we read together? All together, there are 31 verses. Okay, can we read together? At the count of three, let's do it together. Ready? One, two, three. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O you who are enthroned about, upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a woman and not a man. A reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with their lips. They wag their head and saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Yet you, who, you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me. For trouble is near, for there's none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Basha has encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shot, and my thumb cleave to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, and a band of evildoers has accompanied me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divided my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen you answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, pray, glorify him. And stand in all of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despair, nor at heart the affliction of the afflicted, 
nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard, From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. May the Lord bless the public reading of his word. You know, as you read the 32, 25 verses, are there some things that catches your eyes? This, this is a messianic psalms. So is there any part of the, this psalms that tells you about Jesus? Yeah, sorry, I, there's one more. There's one more. So I stopped too early. I stopped too early. There are four, five more verses. All right, ready? One, two, three. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rule over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. All right. So is, are there any verses in the food, the verse 1 to verse 31 that, that stands up to you, that reminds you of Jesus? I tell you what, this is what I like to do. Those of you who are on site, you can pair up and do. Those of you who are at home, you can do it at home as well. All right. You can get in Google any part of Psalms 22 that has been repeated in the New Testament. Verse 1. Verse 18. Okay, Psalms, okay, why don't you all take the next uh, three minutes to do? I, I, I think you can Google, work with somebody, you can Google, see whether any part of Psalms 22 has been repeated in no. uh, the New Testament. Hey, jo um, Pastor, can you hear John on the line? I can't hear John on the line. It's okay, I just said verse 1 and verse 18. Okay, verse, okay, take the next three minutes to, to give everybody a chance to do lah. Huh? Yeah, verse 1 is quite, quite obvious, yeah? But we'll come back to verse 1 later. But take the next three minutes. I'd like you to Google and find out for yourself, all right? typing the answer into the chat box or something. Okay, another 30 more seconds. Okay, let's, let's uh, come back together. 
Now, I, I don't want the wow session to be for you to just be a passive participant. Right? Periodically, I'll just stop and get us to do some activity. All right, so let's hear from the uh, people who are online. All right, what are some uh, verses that you notice uh, is repeated in the New Testament? So John, you, you mentioned, right? John, can you speak again, John? Yeah, uh, verse 1. Yeah, what about verse 1? Uh, Jesus said the same thing. Uh, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani in the New Testament. Uh, which part of New Testament? Uh, at, at, oh, sorry. At, at the crucifixion. Okay. Matthew 27. Okay. Right. So, anybody else? Online? Matthew, tw tw Matthew 27, 46. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other verse in Psalms 22? So many. Verse 18. Verse 18. Yes, 18. What, what does, and what does and how to crucify him, dividing up his clothes, the cast lot to see what each one gets. Say in Mark, Mark um, 15.24. Very good. Okay, anyone, any, uh, one more from the people online before I ask the people on site. <laughs> Who's that? Yeah, verse 18. Uh. Uh, what about verse 18? Verse 18 is, I think those, those soldiers did, did, did this to Jesus. Okay. When they crucify him. Mm. Okay. okay, let me hear from people on site. Okay. So my roving mic will move around as the spirit directs him. If the mic comes to you, mean spirit directed. Uh, how about verse 8? Turn him over to the Lord. Let him save him. I think that comes from the one of the uh, robbers who was crucified. But mm. I don't have the verse in the... New Testament. Okay. Ken, okay. it's Luke 23. Okay. Yeah, Ken. Okay. Okay. So let's have one more person before we, we sum up this part. Oh. And tell uh. the Patrick like to take on Felicia. Uh, I read one that is uh, verse 31. Did someone share about verse 31? Hmm. What about verse 31? Um, there is a commentary that said how it's being fulfilled in John 19, uh, 30, where um, after Jesus received the drink, Jesus said it is finished. Oh, okay. Yeah, so... Hey. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so let me just show you. Uh, again, don't worry about the tables. Uh, these tables will be made available. So verse 1, for example, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, so this is a famous verse quoted by Jesus all right, at the uh, Matthew 27, verse 46. Now, you must know that the Psalms does not have a verse and reference. And so when Jesus quoted, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's by effect uh, quoting the full Psalms 22. Because in those days, Psalms 22 don't have a number 22. It doesn't even have this verse 1, you know. So by, by making the first reference, by inference, he's actually quoting the whole Psalms. So the Lord Jesus actually quoted Psalms 22. That's what I'm trying to impress on you. All right. Then the next one, of course, uh, six, verse 6. But I'm a worm and not a man, a reproach of man and despised by the people. That's in Isaiah 53. Right? But I didn't ask you to go to uh, Old Testament, so... We, we will skip that. Then verse 7, All who see me sneer at me, they separate with the lip and they whack the head. All right? So that is seen in uh, Luke 8, 32-33. Right? And then about Luke 23-35 again. Right? They sneer at him. Then uh, verse 12, talks about him being separated. 
are being surrounded. Right, so this is again brought up in uh, Acts 4 about the people in the city conspire against your holy servant Jesus. Then verse 14, I'm poured out like water and my, all my bones are out of joint. Right, so this is seen in Matthew 26. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Then verse 15, my strength is dried up like a pot shed and my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. All right. Uh, so let me move to the next verse. Next slide. It talks about they have pierced my hands and my feet. Right? Mark 15, 25 tells us that they crucified him. And then, of course, verse 17, that some of you have, have highlighted that they divided his garment. Right? So we see that in Luke 23, they divided up his clothes by casting lot. And then, of course, uh, in John 19 as well. Then the last one is, uh, the last two verses will be verse 22. I'll tell your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I'll praise you. Right? That is quoted in Hebrew 2, 12. Then, of course, the last two verses... Uh, is again quoted in Hebrew to chaff. Don't worry about this. this. All these charts will be put online for you. All right. So now we come to Psalm 22 itself. So what kind of uh, parallelism is this? So we talk about verse 1 already. Let's go to verse 2. Huh? Oh my God, I cry by night, uh, by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Synonymous, right? So by day, I cry no answer. By night, I have no rest. Because why? I got no answer from you. Right? Uh, verse 3, Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. So you can see these two are synonymous. You are holy, you are enthroned. Right? And verse 4, In you, our Father trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. But this one got a bit of building on there. Right? Uh, verse 5, To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Can you see these uh, uh, synonymous verses? Mm -hmm. What can you gather from verse 1 to verse 5? What does that, what can you learn from verse 1 to verse 5? Verse 1 talk about, uh, verse 1 to verse 5 have these two things, right? One is that, I cried but you have not answered me. But my father, they cried, you answered him, them. You get that? And so that is generally the summary for verse 1 to verse 5. All right? So it's a fervent prayer of the one who has been forsaken. All right? So verse 1, verse 2, you have forsaken me. All right? Verse 3, you have heard us. Verse 4, verse 5, you delivered my fathers. Right? Then we go on to the next cycle of uh, prayer, which is from verse 6 to verse 10. I'm a worm and not a man, a reproach, a despise and all that. So verse 9 to verse 10, but I am still trusting you. So you can hear that the, the first, the first uh, verse 1 to verse 10 is a two part of, uh, in a sense, the man before God. Then you move on to verse 11 to verse 18. is the lament of the suffering king. Right? So verse 11, Be not far from me, for the trouble is near, for there is none to help. Then it goes on to tell us, right? uh, so the first cycle of, of, of lament of this suffering king is that my enemies, right, they are well-fed animals. They are animals that are, are strong and they are ready to tear me apart. And verse 14 to uh, 15 basically talks about I'm drained by them. I'm, I'm just wear up by them. Then the second part talks about verse 16 to 18. Right? My, my, how my enemies have surrounded me and tortured me. Right? I'm as good as they. So you can see the first one, the first 10 verses was the man. The next nine verses is also the man. Then 19 to 21 is really petition for help. O you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, 
Hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Now here the dog is referring to what? Huh? The enemies. All right, so it doesn't refer to a physical dog. Okay? Uh, save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. Then the verse 22 to 26 is really, 22 to 31 is basically about praise and encouragement for prayer. Uh, I will praise you. We will praise you. You have heard me and we will continue to praise you. Right? Then the 27 to 31 is about the world will worship you. You rule over the world. The rich and the dying will worship you. And then 30 to 31 for all generations. Putting them together, this will be the outline. Right? This is the outline of uh, Psalms 22 for you. Right? First is a fervent prayer of someone who has been forsaken. And then you continue to lament. But it move on to prayer for deliverance and then it ends with praise. And so that, that is the outline, right? Uh, just to share with you something from the commentaries, right? the psalmist apparently felt forsaken by God as he was surrounded by his enemies. He lamented his tremendous suffering and his desperate struggle with death. This is not talking about David himself. All right? David was pleading with God to deliver him from such a horrible end. Now, of course, apparently his prayer was answered for he was able to declare to the elect and to the world that the Lord answered his prayer. I mean, the fact that he can complete the, the Psalms 22 on the high note means that he was ultimately delivered. Does it make sense to you? All right, so that's the Psalmist. Uh, now, when David wrote these Psalms, would David have known that Jesus is going to quote it? He wouldn't know. He wouldn't know that his experience is a foreshadow of Jesus' experience. This means that when David used many poetic expressions to portray his immense suffering, but this poetic word became literally true to the suffering of Jesus Christ. The interesting feature of this psalm is that it does not include one word of confession of sin, and no imprecation against the enemy, no curse against the enemies. It is primarily the account of a righteous man who was being put to death by a wicked man. So this is a very interesting observation. Right? There's no confession of sin here, unlike other Psalms. Right? Why? Because unbeknown to David, he was writing the suffering Messiah. So when you put this together, the question I like to ask is, what can you learn about God? So until here is observation. Now we move to interpretation. What can you learn about God? Patrick, can you help me? To someone else. <laughs> what can you learn about God? <laughs> He's a God who 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 is not um whose ears are not deaf. Whose ears are not deaf. He's, okay. Yeah, he sees and he listens. Because he delivered the shepherd eventually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can can. Let's okay. move on to another person. Okay. And those of you who are online, uh, will your turn very soon, eh? I'm quite new to this. Well, I can see the body. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That is the fun of uh, studying, but there's no pressure. We're all learning. All right. Uh, we just uh, try. No, no right or wrong. We just learn together. <laughs> what can I learn from God? Hmm. Shu Hua is giving an answer. Eh? Don't have it. Ah, okay. Uh, anybody online would like to try? What can you learn about God? Sorry? Uh, Pastor Cindy, in high year, can I try? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, one aspect that I learned is, you know, God can be trusted uh, to deliver for those who suffer righteously. Okay, so God can deliver. 
Okay. Uh, I think I saw someone wrote on the chat. Nitya, can you can you all read up the chat uh, because I can't. Someone said God is sovereign. Ah, God is sovereign. Okay. But all these are right. I just want to encourage you that when you read the scripture and you learn something about God, it is your own learning. And it's important. And you build your learning from there. But for someone who has gone through this many times and also because I have the benefit of checking commentaries and all that, so I'm just giving you a, a standard answer that is from the commentary. All right? So from this psalm, what can you learn? You can learn that God is a good shepherd who lovingly died for us. Remember I shared with you that this psalm is about Jesus Christ? Right? There's a messianic, it's called messianic psalm. And in this Psalm 22, it basically shows us that Jesus was, in a sense, persecuted, all right? And eventually died for us. So it shows us a good shepherd in that he died for us. That's Psalm 22 for you, all right? Now I'm going to skip my reflection because of time. I'll skip my, I want to go to Psalm 23. Right? So we finished Psalms 22. Let's move to Psalms 23. The reason why I want to cover 22, 23, 24, because this shows us three aspects of God as a shepherd. So the first one is a good shepherd. These Psalms will teach us something else about the shepherd. Right? So again, can, this one is very easy. That's six verses only. Right? So can we read these six verses together? Now, I want to encourage us to read because uh, Psalms, especially for Psalms, they are not meant to be read silently. Psalms is meant to be sung. Right? So, even though I can't sing, the very least I can do is to read it. Right? So, let's read it together. Get a count of three. One, two, three. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, Goodness, loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. All right. So what stands out for us when you think about this? I mean, this is a very popular Psalms, you know. Almost everybody knows Psalms 23. So my question is that, what makes this Psalm so special? Okay, let me just uh, cover a few things just in case I forget. Now, when you read Psalms 23, you cannot read Psalms 23, uh, inverted comma, you cannot read it as a human being. Because it says that my, the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? So who is the I? The, reader, the, the, the one who wrote it is a sheep. So you must read this from a position of a sheep. Now, when it says that I shall not want, doesn't mean that I don't want Jesus. Right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want simply means I have no need. I have no one. Right? This is an old English way of saying things. Right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall have no lack. Because he will provide everything. So then we go on to verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He, led, he leads me beside quiet waters. Now, what's so special about that? Again, I, just in case you know you are still struggling, let me show you photo, uh, pictures. Better? <laughs> All right, so like a little sheep, we are we lie down in green pastures. How would a sheep feel when you are lying beside green pasture? Safe, safe, comfortable, right? You're not, you're not lying on rocks. You're lying on grass, right? 
someone else is grasped through the ship. Good. Right? Imagine yourself lying on top of ice cream bowl, you know, with ice cream. <laughs> okay, if you're not ice cream eater, then of course, you know. Then he says that he leads me beside quiet water. And then again, quiet water is to drink, right? Drink. Yeah. yeah. Thirst. But why quiet water? Safety. Peaceful. What about the safety? Sorry? Peaceful. No danger in the water. Peace. Peaceful. peaceful why, is, yes. why is the peaceful, peaceful needed? Why, why is there a need for that peaceful feeling? The shepherd is there. Where is the you feel the peace because it's calm water, is it? Yes. Okay. So this is sometimes our own human explanation. We must put ourselves as a sheep. Right? When you lie down in green pasture, the first thing you think about is food. And when you go to still water, you think about drinking. All right? So sheep not so complicated. Right? It's real human. Oh, I need a therapeutic place. But sheep, very easy, ah, huh? food and water. All right. Now, um, there's this part that says that for his name, and, and then of course then he will guide me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. That sounded a bit uh, insecure, right? That God need to do it for his own name. Now this is where we need to understand the word his name. What does his name represent? The name of the Lord, what does that represent? Holiness. Righteousness. Okay, the name of the Lord can represent all the good things. Huh? But the name of the Lord essentially represents power. He is. Protection. Right? It represents who He is. So when He says that He guides me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake, to put it in today's language, right, is that He did this because that's who He is. Right? For his name sake is that that's who he is. Right? He guides us in the path of righteousness because that's who he is. Right? Now, I want to highlight something about quiet waters. Why, why sheep need to go to quiet waters? As, yeah, as contrasted, what is, what is the opposite of quiet waters? Running waters. So why cannot go to running waters? Soon. Yes. Okay, some of you have, have whispered your answer. Da, da, da. Let me show you the picture. Eh? That's why all the picture I've, so, I've selected is intentional. Can you see? All right, can you see how, how the distance between the nose and the mouth? Right, the nose and the mouth. So when the water is running, the moment the mouth goes down, what happened to the water? It will splash. It will go into the nose. But if the water is still not moving, then he can drink. It doesn't impact. The water doesn't splash into the nose. That's why quiet water is, in a sense, make it easier for the sheep to drink. That's what a good shepherd does. Look into the what you need so that you can be refreshed without being overwhelmed. Right? So that's a good shepherd. Then there's this part that says that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Right? That's verse what? What verse is that? Five. Verse 5. Right? He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Right? Does it look like this? Some of us think that it looks like that. But I just want to remind you, you are sheep. Sheep don't eat on table. Huh? All right? So what is the correct picture when the shepherd or when the psalm says that, you know, he'll prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? Huh? Got like got goose. All right? Now, this is where the word table may not be a proper translation. Right? It actually means a table land. 
lift a uh, 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 part of the ground that is lifted up from the rest. Right, so like this, this table land, right? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What are the enemies to sheep? Wolves. What else? Lions. Okay, wolf, lion, giraffe, dinosaur. Okay. Uh, what else? What else? Snakes, scorpions. All right, all the cre creeping glory. Yeah. Uh, so what would the shepherd? Uh, what would the shepherd? does beforehand. So before he bring the sheep up this table land, he will go up first. And what he will do is that he will pour salt around the environment. Around the perimeters, he will put salt. All right? Why? Because the, when with, their, with their practices, when they put salt, it kind of deter snakes, scorpions from crawling into the perimeters. So he will prepare the table land before he bring the ship up into the table land. You get a picture? So that's why it says that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Because all the snakes, now, all the uh, scorpions, all that, will want to creep in to, to bite them, but cannot because they are deterred by the perimeter of salt. Right, so, and then, uh, okay, so that, that is what it means. That's why when you read Psalm 23, you must, really from the position of a sheep, then you can really see uh, how much the shepherd would do for us. What's the equivalent of this for us? Our, en our enemies may not be snakes and scorpions. Our enemies can be people, can be the evil one. So in the midst of danger, in the midst of persecution, the law will still prepare a place where you can experience shalom. You can still experience nourishment. Right? Because the table is talking about really food, you see. Right? So the law will provide your, for you both in terms of your nourishment as well as your protection. The law will provide that protection. Then it says that you have anointed my head with oil. So we talk about... Uh, Parallelism, right? So this is also a synonymous parallelism. So you can see the table in, in the presence of enemies. So where is the enemy? Is You have anointed my head with oil. Where is the enemy? Hello, are you there? <laughs> we talk about parallelism. I'm right? talking about this is synonymous. So the first time you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy, and you have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflow. So the first line, the idea is that God provided for us in the presence of enemies. So the second part, you have anointed my head with oil. So where is the enemy? And what is this anointing our head with oil means? All right, so just to help you to see that... Um, there is this little this thing called the little flies, right? That will fly around the sheep during summer. And they will like to deposit their eggs on the damp mucus membrane of the sheep nose. Because mm -hmm. like if, if some of you are familiar with dogs, huh? dogs nose also very damp. Right? So it's the sheep. So then these flies like to go to the dense part and drop their eggs. So what happened when their eggs grew from eggs? to lava, right? What will happen? All these will, will then work their way into the nostril. So what will happen is that when that happens, all right, then the, the, the sheep will be so irritated by all this lava, all this wormy creature going in, well, and then sometimes it can go into the brain. So the sheep will actually knock their head against the tree or the rock, all right, or they do some weird behaviors, and thereby traumatizing the rest of the sheep as well. So what the shepherd must do is that the shepherd will anoint the head with oil so that the oil will go down and fill up all the part of the, the, the nostril as well. And in so doing, it deter the flies from laying eggs on those wet membrane. Are you understand? Right? So what the Lord is doing, by anointing the oil, 
It is so that the oil protects the sheep from having those eggs. Just like the sheep, we must be continuously have this renewed application of oil to forestall the flies in our life. In other words, there must be the continuous anointing of God's Spirit in your life. Just as the sheep, the, the shepherd anoint the head with oil, we need to be anointed with the Holy Spirit to protect us against the flies. Okay? So I hope that they have given new insight to Psalms 23. Uh, okay, so Psalms 23 is really about the Lord is my shepherd. The first part we really talk about the Lord as my leader. Uh, he leads me to green pasture and the quiet waters. He leads me into the righteous path and he comforts me in the valley. And then it says that uh, your, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What's the rod and what's the staff? The rod is literally a, a wooden stick. And the staff is also a wooden stick, but with a curved end. Right? The curved end uh, helps the shepherd to pull the sheep back from danger. So when, when the sheep see the rod and the staff, the rod is to fight off wolves, lions and whatever. The staff is to rescue. So when the sheep see these sticks, right? These are symbols of protection. Then of course, verse 5 talks about the Lord as provider. Provide food, provide oil. Which is provision and protection. Then the response from the sheep is, Surely goodness and kindness will accompany me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Almighty. So it's good for us to read something from the perspective of a sheep. What can you learn about God? Psalm 23, what can you learn about God? So Psalm 22, we know that it's a good shepherd who died for us. Psalm 23 tells us he's a great shepherd who faithfully cares for us. Now tonight, I thought, uh, I started last week, that I'd like to give you time to meditate on the Psalms. So what happened now is that I'd like you to just sit back. Uh, I'm going to stop share for a while. All right? And I'd like to pass the time to meet you to play the same worship song again. It's on Psalm 23. I want to encourage you to, to reflect on the song and allow your mind to visualize those pictures. Right? The song is only about three minutes long. But take the three minutes to visualize the Psalms so that it, it, it becomes real for yourself. Right? That's part of the way of meditating the Word of God. As, we, as you allow the song to repeat to your mind about the Psalms 23, it also allows you to meditate on the different pictures that comes. All right. So I'll pass the time to Miti. But before we do that, let me just pray for us. All right. So Lord, we just commit this time to you. We pray that even as we allow the song to remind us about Psalms 23, Holy Spirit, bring to life the word to all of us. Help us to catch a glimpse again of what a great shepherd you are. The shepherd of our soul. As we commit this time to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord's my shepherd And pastures green He leads me by The still, still waters His goodness restores my soul
Lord, we thank you that you will lead us home. For we are mindful of our human frailty, that how easily we will fall. But Lord, we thank you that you are a great shepherd. You know how to take care of us. That even in our rebellion, you can pull us back. It's just so marvelous for us to think of what a great Savior you are. Holy Spirit, may you continue to tutor our mind and our heart. Help us to catch a fresh revelation of what a great shepherd we have. So that our hearts will always be drawn to worship you. Help us even as we continue to study the book of Psalms together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I need you all to stop share. I trust that you all have been blessed by the worship song. Uh, like I said, the book of Psalms is really about uh, worship. It's really about singing unto the Lord. And I thought that we want to intersper our study of the Psalms with songs. Especially songs that, that, re, that capture the essence of the Psalms for us. Yes, I, I can see that they, uh, John asked that I can uh, read my reflection. Uh, but I, I, because of time, I, I need to move on first. So I will not read my Psalms 23 reflection. I'll do my Psalms 24 reflection, okay? Uh, so this is the staff, right? This is not the rod, this is a staff with a, with a curved band, right? That will help to pull the ship back. Now I want to move on to Psalms 24. Because, uh, like I said, tonight we want to cover the trilogy of Psalms, of the, uh, of the shepherd. So we learned that Psalms 22 is about a good shepherd. Psalms 23 tells us a great shepherd. And now what about Psalms 24? Now Psalms 24 is just a little bit longer. 10 verses. All right? So let's read together. Like I say, some of us, like myself, I can't sing, you know. If I sing, I'll scare the hell out of you. So, but reading, I can. Lah. I think I can. <laughs> okay. So let's read the Psalms together. Here, ready? One, two, three. The earth is the Lord's and all in it contains. The world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the sea and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, 
He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gate, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. What's the meaning of the word Selah? Selah is when you play the harp and the string burst and you shout out, Selah. That's a joke, that's a joke. Okay, it's good to have live audience. We can laugh at my joke. <laughs> the online people like they no no response, but it's okay. So again, uh, you look at the Psalm seventy four. If you, it's quite synonymous in terms of its uh, terrorism, right? The earth is the Lord and all it contains. That says the world and those who dwell in it. Okay, so you can see that it's just synonymous in nature. Right? For he has founded it upon the sea and established it upon the rivers. I, I need to know how to get rid of the pictures because it, keeps, it blocks me. Okay. Uh, ah, okay. So verse 1 and 2 basically tells us that everything belongs to God. Then verse 3 and 4, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? I managed to remove it already. Right? And, oh. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so, Susan, there's not, nothing wrong with you. It's just I, I, I press the wrong button. No, I don't offend anybody. Okay. So, verse 3 Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? So, the hill of the Lord is synonymous with the word. Holy place. Right? So who can who, who can ascend? Who can stand there? He who has clean hand and a pure heart. <coughs> right? The clean hand and pure heart is also paraphrased as those of who have not lifted up his soul to falsehood and who has not so deceitfully. Talk about honesty, talk about integrity of heart. Right? He will receive a blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from God of his salvation. So this is talking about the blessing of those who seek God with a pure heart and a clean hand. Then you move on to the next part, which is really about the king. Lift up you, your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors. So you can see gates, ancient doors. All right? That the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors. This is a repeat of verse 7. Huh? That the king of glory may come in. Then ask again. Verse 10 and verse 8. So say, Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. All right. So you can see verse 7 and 9. Talking about open up the gates and the door. If you personalize it, what, is, what does it mean? In the city, we know that we need to open the door, right? You need to open the gate so that the king can come in, can march in. The king and all his mighty army can march in. It, personalize it. Where is the gate and where is the door? It can be your heart, it can be your head, right? We need to open ourselves to the Lord. And who is this Lord? Verse 9, 8 and 10 tell us he is the king of glory. The repetition stressed the point that the king is glorious king who is coming in. Right? Only the pure worshipper can enjoy his presence. So 7 to 10 is really, a, a, the fact that it's repeated is to emphasize for us who is this king. All right, so we learn that Psalm 22 is about the good shepherd 
Psalms 23 is about the great shepherd. The Psalms 24 is about the glorious shepherd. Oh, you, you, you managed to fill in the blank. <laughs> right? So the good shepherd, why? He died for us. The great shepherd, why? Because he's care for us. And the glorious shepherd, because he is coming back for us. Can I hear Amen. Our God is coming back. Now, you can see because this form of trilogy about the shepherd, not just that he's good that he died for us, not only that he's a great because he cared for us today, but he is glorious because he's coming back. So you can see three different parts of God, the shepherd. Now, let me end by sharing with you my devotion, my reflection, right, just to fulfill the request by John Ong. <laughs> Uh, so this is just, in fact, I, I, I just want to bless you all. I'm going to share with you the reflection by my mentor. Right? My mentor sent me his reflection, so I uh, share with all of us. Right? First, I'm awed. As the, shepherd, as the psalmist begin with the majesty of God, right? verse 1 and 2, the, Lord, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded them upon the sea and established it upon the river. What an awesome God. We must return to catch a big view of who is this God that you worship. He's a great and awesome God who is the creator of heaven and earth. Then it talks about the fact that not only that I'm awed by this great God, I'm challenged because the psalmist asks a very interesting question. Who shall ascend the hills of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? Now, Naturally, we want to say, we want to put our hand, right? We all want to be people who can stand in the presence of God. Who shall ascend the hills of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? Human that we are, we will say, Me, Lord, I want. Me, Lord, I cried out. And may the Spirit stir our hearts to really long to enter the presence of God. But it comes the next thing. I'm all, right? And then this one, the, the third one is, I'm convicted. As the psalmist continues with the God's holy requirement, he who has clean hand and a pure heart, who does not live out his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Clean hands, pure hearts, simple word, tall order. I stand convicted. Because today, even I stand here and teach you all, I dare not say I got pure heart. Maybe some of us are more aligned to God. But as a broken man, I will tell you that I'm so thankful of the grace of God. Because I know how ugly my heart can be. Clean hand, pure heart. To me, woe is me. Because I don't think I can. I don't think I have. So while I'm convicted that I am a sinner, the last thing that I want to share with you is that I'm comforted. Because it says that, leave out your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. That's the first part is that who can go up, right? Now this part is that God is coming in. God wants to come into our lives. I, I'm a sinful man. I have an ugly heart. I have unclean hands. But the King of glory wants to come into my life. I'm comforted. I'm comforted that we have a God that look beyond my weaknesses. As it is, son, I'm coming in. Yeah, of course, verse 8 and 10 is really a, a crescendo. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Come on, let's read together verse 9 and 10. Live up your heads, O gate, and lift them up, O ancient door, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And he's coming into our lives 
and glorify Himself in our lives. Are we deserving? No. Are we worthy? No. But yet the King of glory wants to come into our life tonight. That's why we draw our comfort. Yes, and the mighty angels and all the heavenly hosts roar. What a Saviour! And our soul quietly resonate within. Do it forward. And we can only say, what a Saviour. Because we know that we are sinners. We don't have clean heart. We don't have pure hands. But the King of Glory is saying to you tonight, I'm coming to your life. I'm coming in. Open out your hearts. Open out your mind. Let me come in. You see, Christian life is not about trying. Christian life is about trusting Him. Don't put our confidence in our ability to follow God. Because our ability can fail us. Put our confidence in His ability to lead us. And the King of Glory wants to come into our hearts tonight and tell us, let me take over. Let me take over. Let the glorious King, the glorious Shepherd come to our life tonight. Give Him the steering wheel of our life. And he will lead us to the glorious end. I trust that you've been blessed. Right? As you look at the three portrait of Jesus, a good shepherd, a great shepherd, and a glorious shepherd. They want to do his glorious work of redemption in each and every one of our lives. Right? I've been blessed by reading, and I trust that you have been as well. So now that we are blessed by the Lord and we are encouraged, let me prepare you for next week. And next week, we're going to study the depressive Psalms. Right? But I really want to encourage us because the Word of God is more than enough for us. In fact, I can't wait to teach you Psalms 119. Right? The longest Psalms. But uh, we'll wait. We'll just we'll go from book to book. So to, by today, we are just finished. Are uh, we just sample some psalms from book one. Right? Next week when you come back, we will cover book two of the psalms. Right? So Psalms 42 fall within book two. And then Psalms, uh, the week after, we will come to the most saddest psalm. Right? Any question for me before we end tonight? Uh, Miti, can you read for me if there's some question? No, no questions. No question. Okay. Any question on site? If not, then just let me end in prayer. All right. So Lord, we just want to thank you that the King of glory wants to come into our lives. That Lord, that you love us so much. That Lord, you are knocking at the door of our heart and say, open up. That Lord, that despite of the ugliness that we know that we have within Lord, you want to come in to transform us. Yes. Lord, such thoughts brought such comfort to us. Lord, help us, every one of us, online and on site, to open our hearts to you. Yes. To let the God of glory come in yes. and change us from the inside out. Yes. So that we may experience your goodness, your greatness, and your glory. Yes. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are a good shepherd, great shepherd, and a glorious shepherd. We bless you, Lord. Even as we go our separate way tonight, may the meditation of our mind bring you delight yeah. as we continue to meditate on your truth. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Right, uh, today, the word on Wednesday is over. Have a wonderful week ahead. See you. Yes, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.